Okay, well, good morning, and uh, welcome to church today. I want to start off by uh, reading something that was shared with me, and I'd like to share it with you. And uh, someone was thinking about our church this morning and sent me a little um, poem on this Thanksgiving uh, weekend. And uh, let me just share it with you. I had it here, and, and I dis- it disappeared on me, so let me get it. Technology and I don't mix, you know, sometimes. But, um, okay, here it is. This is uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. For each new morning with its light, for rest and shelter of the night, for health and food to love and friends, for everything thy goodness sends, for flowers that bloom about our feet, to tender grass so fresh, so sweet, for um, song of bird and the hum of bee, for all things... For all things uh, fair we, we hear or see, Father in heaven, we thank thee. To the people of Trinity Baptist Church, you don't know me, but I want you to know that you are very much loved. Signed, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Someone who loves us, who's not here at the church today, I don't know where this person lives, but when I got this wonderful WhatsApp this morning, I just had to share that with you. Um, The phone number is a Saskatchewan-based phone number, uh, but it's not here in the community. Uh, But uh, may that person be richly blessed for thinking of us here this morning as we take a break from our series on 1 Corinthians to talk about Thanksgiving. We live in a a province, for a lot of people tell me it's beige. (laughs) We have two seasons here in Saskatchewan, I was told. We have the spring where everything's green, and then we have beige. (laughs) So right now, I would say that we're more like green, beige, yellow, beautiful, uh, oranges-colored season here in Saskatchewan. People in Ontario brag about their trees, and I've lived there. I know what they're talking about, but nothing beats a beautiful uh, sunset in Saskatchewan. If you would have been living here last night and saw the, the, I guess that was what they classify as a harvest moon, a really, really large moon coming down, or going up, I guess it was. It was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I dare say it's like seeing the northern lights. Where we, I used to live in Ontario, I used to see the northern lights all the time. And that harvest moon looked more beautiful than the, than the northern lights. We need to be very thankful for the things that we have. Uh, this week we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, because it is Thanksgiving long weekend. I haven't preached a message on Thanksgiving for a while, actually. And I thought I would do that today. Next week, we're taking another break. And we're going to hear about an organization called Tear Fund, uh, which used to be known as World Relief. And uh, they're an organization that we, as an uh, as a, uh, organization in Canada, as an association in Canada, have partnered with for when it comes to, uh, uh, third, uh, when it comes to disasters all around the world. They also do um, grain exchange, uh, they do grain um, ministry, uh, supplying grain to countries that are going through famines. They also uh, work on helping, um, helping people uh, become um, more, uh, they provide opportunities, let's put it that way, for people to um, learn a, an industry and a trade, so they'll teach you how to uh, sell your goats and things like that. So we'll, we're going to hear a little bit more about that next week. And once a year, we are asked by the Baptist General Conference of Canada as a church that's affiliated with that organization to consider having a tier fund Sunday. Uh, we are not taking up an offering at that time, uh, but we will be uh, looking at that uh, next week. And then I'll get back to the First Corinthians and uh, Lord willing, we'll... Um, uh, get, keep going along in that. So I'll give you a bit of a break. Today I've entitled my message, uh, 
Is your life one of thanksgiving or complaining? I, uh, here in the community, I don't know what it is in the water, but it's the only place in Canada that I have traveled in my, pro in, in my travels, which have been extensively in Western Canada, where you'll see signs up all over the place that verbal abuse will not be tolerated, the RCMP will be called. Doesn't matter if you're in the bank, grocery store, even city hall. You see these signs everywhere. And I got thinking about us as a community and I thought, what are we doing that people have to feel that they have to put these kinds of signs up? Um, are we a complaining community? I hope not. But when I read those kinds of things, that verbal abuse will not be tolerated, the RCMP will be called, I start thinking that maybe we have a lot of complainers and not a lot of people that are happy. I trust that we as a church family will reflect happiness and not complainers. Uh, in my travels uh, throughout Western Canada, I meet a lot of born-again evangelical believers who are the biggest whiners and complainers on the earth. They're never happy. They are uh, too wet, too dry, too cold, too hot. Economy's lousy. I don't like this. I don't like my car. I don't like my kids. I don't like this. Da, 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 da. And I go, is there anything good in your world? And I'm not talking about one or two people. I'm talking about a lot of people. And thus, today I want us to look at this whole thing about complaining. Is your life one of thanksgiving? Or, um, let me get this going. Or, complaining. When you got up this morning, were you thankful for the day? Or were you complaining that you stubbed your toe? Were you complaining that the cat or dog was licking your face? Or did you greet the day with another day to do things? Thanksgiving or complaining. These words express two contrasting attitudes found in the Lord's children in regards to his dealings with them. You see, the soul that gives thanks can find comfort in everything. The soul that complains can't find comfort in nothing. There is a highway, and I looked this up. If you, want to, you can Google it. It's in South Dakota. It's a place called Yankton, South Dakota. It's a population of about 30,000 people. And this is what's on the sign. Yankton, South Dakota, the home of 30,000 friendly people and a few soreheads. <laughs> The truth is, all of us at times become sore heads. We all get that. I was a sore head yesterday. I was a sore head the day before, and I'll probably be a sore head by the end of this day. I don't know. I, I'm not perfect. We may know it by different terms, or such as griping, grumbling, whining, or belly aching. It was interesting, I, I watched this podcast, I'm starting to get into this podcast done by one of the writers for the uh, Star Phoenix, that we have here in the province, we have the Saskatoon Star Phoenix and the Regina Star Phoenix, which are the same papers, but one is adapted for Saskatoon readers and one's adapted for the Regina area readers. So the Regina readers are the southern province, the Saskatoon ones for the northern province. Anyways, they have a sports writer there. He has this podcast. And uh, he does a writer, Saskatchewan Rough Riders podcast, and he brings on different people to talk about the beloved Rough Riders, which uh, TSN uh, is scared to say anything bad about because the people jump all over them. Uh, it seems like here in the province, as soon as you say anything negative about the Rough Riders, you're a bad person. However, this podcast is certainly exposing a lot of this behavior as being uh, pretty... Uh, um, what would you classify it as? Um, pretty, um, uh, speaking now with both sides of their mouth. <laughs> and uh, there's a quarterback for the team. His name is um, 
for Jardo. Forget his first name. What's his first name? Cody for Jardo. And this one guy who's a retired rough rider said to this reporter on this podcast, he's a really nice guy. But man, I sure wish he'd stop complaining about our fans and quit being a crybaby about the fact that he doesn't like it when the fans complain about him. Well, guess what, buddy? Grow up. You're, the, you're like playing for the Maple Leafs in Ontario. You're playing for the Rough Riders in Saskatchewan. You need to take your lumps. If you play bad, you're going to hear about it. If you play good, you're going to hear about it. But stop whining. And I thought, wow, there you go. I say that because this is a common theme of this whole thing. The people are not very thankful. They complain a lot. Uh, if I was Cody Fajardo, I'd be thankful I had a job. Well, the way that the Rough Riders are playing this year, I'm surprised they haven't benched him two, three times this year. And when he gets benched, he stomps around like a little baby. So I'm hoping that the general manager of the Riders gets himself a real quarterback who's got really good social skills and really good skills on the field and is not crying so much about his own life and think about the team. In the King James Version of the Bible, they talk about murmuring. And regardless of the word we use to describe it, complaining always has the same symptoms. The dictionary, the Webster's Dictionary, defines it as an expression of unhappiness, uh, dissatisfaction or discontent. Complaining is the outward expression of discontent from within. A certain man, well known for his constant complaining, inherited a large sum of money. When he got it, he complained about how it was not much as he thought it should be. He bought a farm and asked his wife what she should name it. She quickly answered, why don't you call it Belly Acres? <laughs> I suggest to you that this message probably won't apply to most of you this morning. I hope not. I'm sure that uh, uh, none of you have a problem with complaining, but you probably know someone who needs to hear this. Complaining seems to have become the great Canadian pastime. We live in a complaining society. I get on a plane and I hear the first thing out of people's mouths is some negative comment. It's very, very seldom that somebody look at me and said, I am so excited I'm going to visit my granddaughter. They go, oh, it's about time we got on this plane. Oh, it's so hot in here. So where are you going? Oh, I'm going to visit my granddaughter. Oh, that's great. Why don't you start off with that? It's all the time. Belly acres, right? People gripe about everything. Complaining seems to be a popular pastime. People reach the peak of satisfaction when they're complaining. Co couples get together for an evening of fellowship, and the first thing you know, someone is complaining about someone or something that's going on. Employees complain about the company in which they work for. Students complain about teachers and workloads. Complaining seems to be normal procedure these days. Complaining is so common these days that it could be called a way of life for many people. Um, I had people in my life in the past who were such negative people that you would not dare ask them how they're doing because you're going to be there for an hour as they continue to complain about every ache and pain and every little thing that goes on in their life to the point where you're going i just gotta go just about everybody complains and why not i mean there's a lot to complain about we can complain about the traffic we complain about taxes we can complain about that trudeau that premier of the province that 
idiot mayor, as I heard one day. Oh, the idiot mayor of the town I was in. I was like, oh, come on, he's a nice guy. He's in the congregation here today. Don't call him an idiot. He's sitting right over there. Oh, I didn't see him come in. Shit. But the commonness of complaining does not make it right. You see, because the word of God comes down pretty hard on the sin of complaining. I heard this quote one day. Someone said on the seventh day God rested and on the eighth day God started answering complaints. <laughs> Few sins are as ugly to the Lord as the sin of complaining. There seems to be very little thankfulness or gratitude today among the Lord's people, but a whole lot of complaining. Complaining is part of our culture, but it sure is not anything new. Who was the first complainer in the Bible? It was Adam. The man said, this is to do with the Adam and Eve, you know, the, the apple deal or the, the fruit deal, pulling the fruit off the vine. The woman whom you gave to me, gave to me with, <laughs> you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate it. It's her fault. Complaining. Um, complaining is one of the most prevalent sins I suggest to you and, and I feel this and I know this among born again evangelical Jesus followers we are terrible complainers um, you know I, I've, I meet a lot of people in my, my given week or my given month and, and the ones that complain the most are those who shouldn't be complaining at all I mean, after all, all complaining, as I said, is against the Lord and his providential will for our lives. You see, to murmur, as they say in the King James, to grumble, to complain against the Lord is a sin, and we must recognize it as such. So Christians living in North America today should know the dangers of complaining. When we obviously do not think too much of it, we all seem to do it. Complaining is a symptom of a deep-seated spiritual problem in a person's life. You know that? A failure to trust the Lord and a failure to be submissive to his proverbial provision in your life. That's what it is. It's a sin issue. Complaining is a serious sin, and we tend to take it very lightly, evidenced by the fact that we do it so often. Um... Numbers chapter 11 verse 1 says, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Interesting. Christians who complain about their circumstances would do well to ponder this sobering verse in its background. You see, the Lord had greatly blessed his people. He greatly blessed Israel, delivering them supernaturally from the slavery in Egypt, protecting them against their enemies, and even miraculously supplying daily bread and water for them in the desert. And still, they complained. Complained about their food. Complained about their Im imaginary uh, luxuries. They, uh, they, they, they had left behind in Egypt. They complained against their leaders. Because it says there in verse, 11, verse 1, you can read it for yourself. And when the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. You see, the Lord had had enough. And the Lord was... What did he do? He said, enough. I'm done. And a bunch of people died because of the complaining. Let me give you three reasons why complaining is displeasing to the Lord. And this is our outline. First of all, complaining denies God's sovereignty. Complaining disrupts Christian unity. And complaining discredits Christian testimony. Why would anybody want to become a Christian? Or why would somebody want to go to a church if all they hear coming out of your mouth is nothing but complaints? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God here this morning. I pray, Father, that I do the text justice. 
I pray, Father, that people will understand how important it is for us to, uh, to be people of the book and people who grow in their walk with God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, complaining denies God's sovereignty. Exodus chapter 5, verse 2 says, But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice, he says. The sovereign God of the universe showed his power. The Israelites leave Israel wealthy, or I'm sorry, Egypt wealthy and go through the Red Sea on dry land and God destroys their enemies. Their success in entering the promised land depended on the sovereignty of God. So when they murmur and complain against Moses and Aaron, they are calling to questions God's ability to carry out his will. Complaining, of course, is just a surface symptom of much deeper problems, and that's discontent. This is why the Bible so strongly condemns complaining. The murmurings and grumblings of complaint of complaints are evidence that we are dissatisfied with the way the Lord is, is, right, is, is, is leading us. We're not happy with that. The solution to this problem, I feel, in my opinion, is to recognize their sin and then realize and acknowledge that our Heavenly Father always knows what's best for us, even down to the little problems He allows us to face. Think about that for a moment. Everything that goes on in your life, why do we always take it to the negative? Why can't we take it to the positive? As I've always said, for every problem, there's a solution. God has given us a brain. God has given us prayer. God has given us ways of getting through this. Why do we sit there and soak sour and murmur and complain when there is a solution? Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You see, every complaint against our circumstances, every grumble about the weather, about the way people treat us, about the daily trials of life is directed against the one who works all things after the counsel of his own will. What am I to put the Almighty God under cross-exam for? Am I in a better position than he is to judge what is and is not good for me? How far can I see into the future? Who am I to strike out against God with complaining of my circumstances? So we see Paul in Acts chapter 16 is in a Philippian jail and, and we do not see Paul complaining but rejoicing. He trusted God's sovereignty no matter what was going on in his life. And then one of the big problems that I see with complaining is that it focuses on what's frustrating us and it forgets about the big picture. For example, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, they go on to complain about their wilderness diet. They went on to talk about what great food they had in Egypt. They forgot they were slaves there. I'd ask you that when you get all nearsighted and just looking at the irritations and the frustrations in front of us, we lose our perspective. We blow today's problems way out of proportion in my mind and we forget the larger picture of the great things that God is doing in our lives. You see, we miss the big, what I call tapestry. The big picture includes God's sovereignty. Because we need to remember Complaining is always an expression of unbelief toward the Lord's sovereignty in our life. That's, at least that's how I feel. Complaining is unbelief in God's words, which says, all things work together for good for them that love God to, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I'm not perfect. I complain a lot. And this is speaking to me as much as it's speaking to you today, whoever, whoever this applies to. 
And I suggest to you, if the Christians really believe that the Lord is in control of their lives and is working all things together for good, that, like I'm trying to do, is stop complaining and start thanking the Lord for the plan He is working together for us. You know? Those people watching by way of video, do you complain? Don't be too quick to answer that one. Think about it for a minute. One of the things I hear a lot where we live is about the weather. What are your comments about the weather usually like? How do you speak about those people around you? The kinds of things do you say about your job? Do you complain about someone who has not treated you the way you thought you should be treated? It's interesting. As I said, Christians seem to be the biggest culprits. We need to examine ourselves. Are we thankful for cold weather? Are we thankful for hot weather, rainy weather, cloudy weather, sunny weather? Have you ever complained when the weather ruined your plans? Are you truly content with what the Lord determines for you on a daily basis? Complaining is, a, is directed not at this world, but at the Lord who, are, who has ordered our circumstances. Have you ever thought about that? It's God's sovereign will for us to be going to whatever it is that's going on in our lives. Complaining is a symptom of a deep-seated spiritual problem as far as I'm concerned. And what is that problem? It is a failure to trust the Lord and failure to submit to His prov providential will. Complaining is a deep-seated spiritual problem. It's not superficial. Complaining is dis distrust against the Lord and not non-submission to His plan and purpose for our lives. And thus, some people, and I, I agree with what I was studying this week, is a lot of people, theologians, feel that complaining is a serious sin that we as evangelicals are really terrible for. Secondly, complaining disrupts Christian unity. Numbers 13, verses 30 to 33, says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, uh, Nephilims, the sons of Anak, who comes from Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. This is all about some guys that went to scout out this promised land and, said, and came back with a really bad report, a very negative report. I mean, in verse 33, they theoretically exaggerated how bad it was. Numbers 14, 36 and the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. They affected the whole nation with their negativity. The spies started the complaining and the whole congregation picked it up. And the sin is so contagious that it spreads like wildfire. When one dog begins to bark, a number of dogs begins to bark. At least in my neighborhood they do. <laughs> When one frog begins to croak in a pond, others begin to croak. You get one disgruntled complainer in a congregation and it won't be long before it spreads to many. And I used to think that people complained because they had a lot of problems. However, I've come to realize that they have a lot of problems because they complain. You see, complaining does not change anything or make situation better. It amplifies, it frustrates, it spreads discontent and discord. And here we are on Thanksgiving Sunday and we're having to talk about complaining. Proverbs 16, 16, 
to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven, they're an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breaks our lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Thirdly and finally, complaining discredits our Christian testimony. We talk about the Lord's, we talk about how much we love the Lord and how good it is, He is, but we off, often live like atheists, as one guy told me, murmuring and complaining all the time. Philippians 2, 14 to 15 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation among whom they, you shine as lights in the world. What we see in this text is that this is the very reason why we are to do all things without complaining. So that you will be a blameless, harmless, above reproach child of God. You are called to be all that and that's a child of God. And how you live has a dramatic impact, impact not only on whether or not you're consistent as a child of God, it's to do with all your murmuring, complaining. You see, a Christian who is always grumbling and complaining is harmful to the cause of Christ and the name of Christianity. Because after all, nobody likes to be around people who are always grumbling and complaining. The world's not attracted to such a person. I, I really believe that. A young girl surprised her mother with a beautiful and unexpected gift that she had purchased with her own allowance. And the little girl said, Mom, this is for you because you worked so hard and nobody seems to appreciate it around here. Her mother said in a modest voice, Well, you know, your father works hard too. The little girl replied, I know, but he does not complain about it. <laughs> we fall apart in the midst of trials and the world says where is their God Paul and Silas must have been a tremendous testimony in the Philippian jail and what if they would have been murmuring and complaining and griping about their situation what if Silas would have said Paul stop stop why are you complaining so much he didn't say that did he no If that dialogue had ever been going on, Paul and Silas constantly complaining about their situation being in jail, do you think for one minute that that jailer would have been saved? I doubt it. He probably would have said something to the effect of, what must I do to stay away from these people? Man, they got nothing good to say. You see, our testimony is important. It's very important. God uses our lives to influence others. So most of the time, when we are grumbling, we don't have any reason for doing so. Most of the people who grumble are like the man who was always complaining and never happy with anything. Such as the day when he walked into a hardware store and asked for a chainsaw advertised to cut six advertising to cut six trees in an hour. He came back the next day fussing, grumbling, and complaining and threw the chainsaw down. And he said, this chainsaw is defective. It would only cut one tree and it took all day. The sales rep looked at it, reached down, started the chainsaw, and the man yelled, What's that noise? When we stop and think of it, it's not long that we realize how much we have been blessed. After I finish recording here, I'm going to spend a little time with my own church family, and I'd like us to share some Thanksgiving things that we can be thankful for. I wish you could hear those, but you need to come to church at 11 a.m. and be part of us to hear what we have to say.
because we have a lot of wonderful things to, to express thanksgiving for. Each of us has been blessed in numerous ways. The more we think about how we have been blessed, the more we will be thankful. A.W. Tozer is my favorite author. I read his books all the time. They, they give me such incredible charges. I've been reading them ever since I came to Christ. He said this, Among those sins most exquisitely fitted to injure the soul and destroy the testimony, few can equal the sin of complaining. You see, complainers are, as I heard from an old wise elder, said, Pastor, complainers are missionaries of misery. (laughs) Complaining always hurts those around us. And it takes no special skill, talent, or IQ. Anybody can do it. We got to be people that are less complainers and more positive. And Thanksgiving is a good time to remind ourselves of how serious the sin is. If someone is a drunk or has a filthy mouth, we tell them that it's a sin and they need to stop. But somehow when it comes to the sin of complaining, we rationalize and excuse it. It's no different than being a drinker, a drunkard, or a foul-mouthed person. I close with an illustration here. Two boys were eating some grapes, and one of them remarked, aren't they sweet? The other one said, yeah, I guess so. But they're full of seeds. Wandering into the garden, the first boy explained, look at those big, beautiful red roses. The other commented, yeah, but they're full of thorns. It was a warm day, so they stopped at the store for a soft drink. After several swallows, the the second youngster complained, my bottle's half empty already. And the first quickly responded, mine's still half full. You see, many believers are like the negative thinking boy in this story. They always look at life through dark glasses. Uh, Like the children of Israel in today's scripture, they complained and grumbled, and when they should be praising the Lord for his gracious provisions. So in conclusion, the, next, the three reasons the Lord does not like complaining are complaining denies God's sovereignty, complaining disrupts Christian unity, and complaining discredits our Christian testimony. So on this Thanksgiving Sunday, may we affirm in our hearts that we need to find the positives in things. And it's hard. And it's hard, but I know that sometimes we have to think beyond that. I have really worked hard for the last, uh, uh, I would say, two, three years to try to find positive things. I'm not good sometimes with it because I came from a home. I was raised in an environment where it was all negative. Negative, negative, negative. My dad didn't, couldn't find anything good about nobody. Um, the environment in which I grew up in was just this hotbed of ugliness because it just, that's just the way it was. Ministry sometimes can make us very negative. It's hard. So the bottom line is, praise is the best deterrent, I know, for complaining. Believers who keep praising the Lord usually achieve the victory over complaining, and I'm working on that. One of the things I have on my watch is I have I am statements on my watch now. And these I am statements are just little short, little pithy sentences of positive thoughts. For example, when I was sitting here preaching, my watch went bzz, bzz. It says, I bring success to all parts of my life. And it just agreed with me, my, my, my uh, tablet. But I, I have all sorts that I have 
Uh, and some of them I've actually taken pictures of and kept in my phone. And I, I just want to share a couple with you before we go. And um, uh, i got to find the right page. Here it is. I put it right in my phone. I am statements. Let's see. With every breath, I release the anxiety within me. Life gets easier when I have a positive attitude. I am grateful those who stick around me when I'm feeling down. Today is going to be an amazing adventure, and it goes on and on and on, and I have them as off my phone, and what I would do is I'd say, oh, that's a good one, and I would take a picture of it, and I'd put it in my phone, and so when I'm waiting for things or things are going on, I, I scroll through these statements. And I start to pray and I say, Lord, give me the opportunity, give me the, the way to just be a little bit more happier in life and a little bit more less complaining. So praise is the best determinant I know for complaining. Let's close in prayer and then in a couple of minutes here, we're going to sing a song and in a couple of minutes, we as a church family, just going to spend a couple of minutes and thank, thanking the Lord uh, for what he's done for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege we have of being people of the book. You give us your word to help us. Father, thank you that we find ourselves here in church today and on this Thanksgiving Sunday. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to understand your word better, help us to apply it. I know that this is a... a, passage or this is a message that some people would probably find irritating others would find challenging others would find it as not uh, applying to them or or uh, that they know someone that could really hear this message it's going to be all over the map and i get that because father we are poking right at the the very things that we not we should not be doing and so, Father, I'd ask for your forgiveness for, uh, for our attitude towards this whole area of, about complaining. This is Thanksgiving. And we do thank you, Father, for us as a church. For, we thank you for so much. We thank you for those who tune in to our uh, website, YouTube, um, to the uh, Facebook and follow us along and are encouraged along. And thank you for this individual who sent me this uh, wonderful little note this morning through WhatsApp. Uh, and I just pray, Father, that you would um, be with this person who just wanted to, to communicate to us how much they're thankful for us as a church family. And we're thankful for everyone who is part of our church family, be they here or online. And uh, so, Father, now as we continue in our service, uh, where we're going to sing a wonderful song together, then afterwards, time of thanksgiving, um, praise items, I praise you and thank you for it. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.